Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the agenda of my talk. We will talk a little bit about glycemic variability. Then we try to understand something about pattern management and how can we uh, increase patient confidence and skill to achieve a better compliance. And finally, I will have an exciting part of my talk, as Ramsey said, because I'm going to talk about the patient. Um, this is a famous paper published in 2008 by Roger Maze, uh, which, which explains how IGP is built. And uh, uh, Ramsey has already showed us how we can build a, a, an AGP, an ambulatory glucose profile. But what I would like to underline with this slide is the fact that in normal subject, uh, glucose is a very stable and it remains between 70 to 140 milligrams per deciliter. Unfortunately, in diabetic patient, in particular in type 1 diabetic patient, uh, glucose has variability. And how we can, def can we define glucose variability? We can define variability as hypoglycemic events. You can see them with the blue circle. Then with postprandial glucose excursion, red circle, but also with minor fluctuation in blood glucose level. We know that glucose variability is bad. In type 1 diabetes, I refer now to the famous DCCT study. In an original paper published by Kilpatrick in 2006, glycemic instability wasn't a predictor for microvascular complication in patients from DCCT. But later, in 2008, Kilpatrick published a couple of papers showing that mean daily glucose, as well as postprandial hyperglycemia, were a predictor for cardiovascular diseases in the same cohort. And also that HbA1c instability was a predictor of microvascular complication. I would like to, to present you this paper published in 2012 by Antonio Ceriello, which uh, is focused on a prototype of glucose variability, which is the recovery from an hypoglycemia. In this experimental design, both normal subject and type 1 patient, normal subjects are presented with an open symbol and the full symbol are type 1 diabetic patient, uh, were uh, induced to hypoglycemia. And then there was the recovery from hypoglycemia with normal glycemia or hyperglycemia. What uh, Antonio uh, showed in this paper, demonstrated that flow-mediated dilation, production of prostaglandin F2A, and the interleukin-6 in, uh, were altered by hypoglycemia, and uh, this value become much worse if after an hypoglycemia, the patient goes to hyperglycemia. And this value remain altered after six hours whereas they improved if after the hypoglycemia they were on normal glycemia. This year, we uh, published together some more data on uh, this experiment, and uh, we uh, wanted to look at uh, thrombosis activation, which is the mechanism by which the cardiovascular events can occur. And uh, with the same experimental design, we saw that if, in, if we induce an hypoglycemia to normal subject or to type 1 diabetic subject, uh, we have a, an alteration of this uh, variable like von Willebrand factor, prothrombin factor, uh, thrombin antithrombin uh, 3 complexes, P selectin, and so on. And uh, these were all altered and significantly uh, altered versus uh, baseline, baseline values. Therefore, hypoglycemia affect thrombosis activation, inflammation, and oxidative stress. Then, we recovered to normal glycemia, and we see 
uh, an improve of all parameters versus hypoglycemia. If we recover with hyperglycemia after hypoglycemia, all these parameters worsen. And the value were much worse than normal glycemia. And this effect persisted even after additional six hours of normal glycemia and was counterbalanced by vitamin C infusion, but I don't want to go in detail. The message is that uh, hyperglycemia following hypoglycemia activate thrombosis through the oxidative stress production. We know that we have to face not only glyce um, uh, mean blood glucose, high blood glucose in type 1 diabetes, but also uh, glucose variability, because uh, reducing average glycemia without reducing, reducing variability can be very dangerous. This is a profile of a type 1 diabetic patient with a good mean blood glucose, 157 milligrams per, de per deciliter. If we make a simulation and we try with a treatment to reduce mean blood glucose, leaving the same profile, what we can see? We can see that there is a reduction of all values, and we expose the patient to hypoglycemic episode, as you can see in the lower panel. How to measure glucose variability? This is a problem in our outpatient clinic every day. We have several tools. We can measure glucose variability, making consecutive fasting blood glucose measure measurement, as has been presented by Ramsey in the Lean paper, and measuring standard deviation or coefficient of variation of fasting, plasma, uh, fasting blood glucose values. We can measure variability using uh, SMBG, looking at standard deviation or coefficient of variation, or uh, using the Kovacev index, like uh, ADRR. And obviously, the best way is to measure glucose variability is uh, through the continuous glucose monitoring, UZIs, MAGES, and other measures. But so we have several ways, several tools to measure variability. And uh, uh, Earl, Hirsch, and Brownlee, some years ago, have introduced a new concept, a new approach to evaluate glucose control in our patient, that they introduced the concept of glucometrics, which is the descriptive analysis of all aspects of glycemia, not only the fasting or the postprandial or HbA1c, but the, all the values we can use to understand whether our patient is good control or not. And this glucometrics approach is important to assess variability uh, with both with the continuous glucose monitors or home blood glucose monitoring. We are able to identify pattern. I'm sure that uh, all of us in this room can understand that looking at this uh, patient diary that this patient has postprandial hyperglycemia after breakfast, after lunch, after dinner. So we can identify pattern with an old approach, which is di uh, the, 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 the diary. Now we have also some software. We use, this is the software I'm using in, in my clinic, and uh, with the clinic, with this software, we can improve our ability to understand the trends of our glucose. But uh, we have to talk with the patient. And uh, I would like to present this survey, which has been published uh, some 2011, uh, regarding some question that have been uh, uh, asked to patient uh, regarding uh, their uh, feeling, uh, their um, uh, personal feeling about uh, uh, SMBG, for example. And uh, it, is it is interesting to note that uh, three quarters of patients with type 1 type 2 diabetes did not disagree with the statement, my body tells me without testing if my blood sugar is low or high. And we know that uh, the patient used to say this to us. And uh, in the same paper, it was uh, demonstrated that uh, the ability to catch the right 
uh, value was 50%. So th if they say I'm low now, they have 50% prob 50 probability to be right, but also to be wrong. Another interesting point was that uh, roughly half of this patient failed to agree that I should test my blood sugar after meals. And uh, they also do not, uh, did not agree that uh, I know how to look for patterns in my blood sugar readings. We know from this paper published by Simon Heller that uh, education and self-management are very important because they, if we educate patients, we know, you know that Simon Heller is one of the, the physicians involved in the Daphne project, uh, the education to understand the pattern of blood glucose is very important to obtain a, a, a good glycemic control. And uh, I would like to show you what is one of the definition of pattern management, which is the application of a systematic analysis of data by both people with diabetes, but also by healthcare professionals in the daily, weekly, and long-term management of blood glucose level, and is a priority for all people with diabetes. There are several other definitions of uh, pattern management, and uh, what I would like to underline is uh, what has to be involved to evaluate a, the pattern management. Five steps. The first step is to know your target blood glucose range. You have to decide which is your target, as Ramsey has showed us with the, his first patient. In, the, in that case, avoid hypoglycemia. Second, gather all necessary data, blood glucose, carbohydrate consumption, insulin doses, activity levels, and so on. Third step, look for pattern and glycemic abnormalities. Four, assess influencing factor and possible causes. And finally, take an action. If you don't take an action, all the previous work is useful, is uh, uh, un unuseful. We know from another survey, this conducted in US, that the search for patterns is difficult. And most of the patient treat their individual blood glucose without looking behind. And only 10% of patients check their previous high and low values. And even in, in the DCCT patient, it has been demonstrated that pattern management is an essential component for reaching a, blue, a good glucose control, even in inpatient management. But we have to remember that we are dealing with human beings, with patients, and there are barriers to pattern management. I, have the opportunity, I had the opportunity to, to write this review with Gerard Reac, with uh, I think all of you know very well, and uh, we look at some emotional and psychological reason why the patient is sometimes don't do a good pattern management. And one of the reasons could be lack of motivation, lack of appropriate beliefs, and fear of negative consequences, or fear of hypoglycemia. Ramsey has already introduced you to the AGP, the ambulatory glucose profile, so I want you to concentrate only in the last sentence of this slide. AGP enables a rapid assessment of glucose, stability and variability for the instant recognition by the clinician. So in a, very quickly, you can see a median. You can see the 25 to 75 percentile, which represent variability. And you can also evaluate rapidly the outliers, the values between 10th and the, the 10th and the 90th percentile. Finally, I would like to introduce you Claudio. Claudio is a 32 years old gentleman. He was diagnosed of type 1 diabetes when he was nine in 1991. He came for the first time in our outpatient clinic in 2008 where we diagnosed an hypoglycemia and awareness. His HbA1c was 5.9. Then we 
with the traditional diary, we tried to avoid hypoglycemias. And after three months, his HbA1c raises to 7.4, and he recovered from uh, hypoglycemia and awareness. Up to 2014, his HbA1c range between 7 and 8.5, so is in line with the data presented by Earl Hirsch for a, a person uh, above 20 years of age. In October last year, Claudio came in my outpatient clinic. He graduate, graduated in one of the most famous universities in Milan, in Bocconi University. He's got his degree in economics. He was a, a manager in a very important bank, Deutsche Bank in Milan. And he came in my clinic and said, I'm not happy. I don't like to wear the tie every day to go in the bank. I love traveling. Uh, and traveling uh, uh, in some way, type 1 diabetes was sometime an obstacle for me for traveling. I have a dream. I want to make a journey around the world without using a flight, without using a plane, and trying to live with 15 euros per day. So he said, uh, do you allow me? And I said, you are 32. I'm not your father. You can do whatever you want. When I knew that he told my, my response to his mother, his mother was very upset with me. <laughs> Therefore, he quit, he left his job, and on May this year, he starts for a trip. He has no complication, very good values, and uh, this is his trip after 10, uh, 100 days. Now he's uh, in uh, Rajasthan in India. So he started from uh, uh, Piacenza, which is a tiny town uh, south Milan. Then he moved to Varsavia and so on. He's planning to do this, this journey in the next month up to, uh, to Australia. Then he already got the opportunity to, to travel with a cargo boat to San Francisco. And then in the next year and a half, he will go to uh, the Americas, Africa, and back. Thanks to Abbott Italy, I had the opportunity to give him a navigator CGM. And uh, we tested his AGP before departure. And this is Claudio's AGP before departure. As you can see, in the last uh, 12, uh, two weeks before the departure, he used to go outside with the friends to say hello to everybody, a lot of beer, a lot of uh, good dinners, and his median was high after dinner and remained high during the night, with a big variability, as you can see here, in the morning. Okay. Then he moved to Russia and Mongolia, and uh, as you can see, the, the, at least during the night, his median was, was not bad. But the problem was the breakfast and the low exercise because he spent five days in the Trans-Siberian train. And uh, the, the breakfast were very sweet. And uh, if you go to his uh, site, which is uh, www.triptherapy.net, you can find his story uh, because he's publishing stories and videos. This is the, another way to look at the result with the uh, CGM navigator, which is the diary. You have all the, the glucose values in a diary, so you can compare them with the food and then so on. These are the data in China, in Nepal, where he had the opportunity to work in a, an orphanage for a month. And uh, the food, unfortunately, in the orphanage was very bad, and sometime during the night he didn't eat a lot. And you can see the median went down, and, uh, and he had a lot of hypoglycemia during the night. Then he had the opportunity to do a meditation course with the monks in uh, Nepal. And after a meditation course, this is his AGP. Probably we find another way to treat type 1 diabetes, do some meditation. Because as you can see here, 
the variability is much, much, very much reduced. The median was high, in particular during the night, because for several reasons also related to the food. These foods are very different from our foods. And this is the last AGP Claudio sent me, the 3rd of September. This outlier is interesting. These, these data are one night, probably, he didn't inject uh, rapid insulin, and he remained above 350 for more than four hours during the night, and this is the outlier. But his median is now not bad, and variability is not bad at all. And finally, I would like Claudio want to say you hello. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao, Claudio. Mi chiamo Claudio, vuol dare tutto dirò inizialmente dall'Italia e attraverso tutta l'Asia e raggiungerò gli anni fa. Lo so, che sogno venito. Ciao mondo, ciao mondo, se come segue anche oggi, il secondo giorno, questi soldi, si starà di soldi, si starà di tanto, ma oggi siamo a Barsa. Sulla mosca, il sole splende anche oggi. Ciao, Ciao. oggi è il terzo giorno sulla transfermiera. Una sorta di capitale di là. L'isola di Oro. e si prende cura di bambini, orfani, oppure provenienti dalle mulzioni familiari molto caro. Ci trovo a Pocara. Namaste. 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 Grazie a Abbott. Thanks to Abbott, uh, Claudio, uh, we received from his family the new device uh, in a couple of weeks. And uh, I, when I see these images, I can say that diabetes, type 1 diabetes is not the limit for nothing. Thank you.